My first question is, uh, um, can you please, uh, explain for me the difference between the Trinitarian and the Therism? That's the first thing that I want to know before I put it to the rest of the things and the clarification from yesterday's answer. Are you asking the difference between the Trinitarian and the Tritheist? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the Trinitarian is basically the same thing that Catholics are and the same thing that the second fundamental doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is. They believe in one God in three persons. A unity of three co-eternal persons is actually the wording. So if you go to the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine and you look at what that says and what it's teaching, you're going to find that it is Basically, the second fundamental doctrine is Trinitarian, not tritheist. But when you go to the third, fourth, and fifth doctrines in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you're going to find that that is tritheist. So number two is Trinitarian. Three, four, and five are um, tritheist. Now, here's the difference. The Trinitarian believes that there is one God that is three, okay? <clears throat> There's an idea of what's called consubstantial. If you've ever known anybody or seen online the pictures of conjoined twins, C-O-N-J-O-I-N-E-D, conjoined twins, you'll be able to see that there's perhaps one body with two heads, okay? Or one body with four legs and four arms and one head or you just lots of different combinations of two people into one that's called conjoined and the trinitarian believes that god is conjoined with the son and the spirit so they're one being they're not three separate beings okay so that's trinitarianism in its uh purity i guess if, if you could call Trinitarianism pure. But the, and, and that's generally referred to as the Catholic version of the Trinity. Well, it's spelled out very clearly in the second fundamental doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And also it's alluded to in the 14th when it calls the, when it calls their God, the triune God. And they're saying that the husband and wife are one, kind of like the triune God is one, and they're supposed to be unity, etc. The tritheist, on the other hand, believes in three separate beings. Okay, not conjoined, but they're, uh, no, sorry, yeah, not consubstantial, they're co-substantial. That means the Father and the Son and the Spirit, so there's three of them, that are all of the same substance. And that means that God the Father is equal to the Son, which is equal to the Spirit, meaning the Spirit is equal to the Father. A equals B, and B equals C, therefore C equals A, right? Well, you have this idea of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three co-eternal, co-substantial, co um Om, you know, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, everything the same, identical. Well, my question would be, then why, pray tell, does God the Father bring forth the Son, give the Son life? Okay, so bring forth the Son, John 3, 16. Give the Son life, John 5, 26. Give the Son all power, Matthew 28, verse 19. Uh, provide for us through His Son, Psalm, I mean, uh, Philippians chapter 4, I think it's verse like 15 or 16. I don't remember that one. But you can see in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, that the Father gave a throne to his Son. You can see that, um, you know, it just goes on and on. I've got a whole list of these in my notes where it shows God has given all the things that, we, that he has to his Son. So if they're consubstantial, co-equal, and co-eternal, why, pray tell, would God have to give anything to his Son? And where does the Bible say that God gave anything to the Spirit? 
And so why would he give stuff to his son but not to the Spirit? And why hasn't the Spirit ever given anything to God the Father? God loves his son, but why doesn't the Bible ever say we're supposed to love the, or God loves the Spirit? And are we supposed to pray to the Spirit? Are we supposed to pray to Jesus? Are we supposed to pray to God the Father? How does this work? Where was the Spirit in creation? Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 doesn't say anything except that the Spirit was there. And what does that mean? So when you have this tritheistic idea, which was more of what I was as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, it becomes very confusing when you step outside of the concept and start looking at it objectively and also critically. So three gods brings a lot of trouble because the Bible says there's only one God. And if that one God is three, then you don't have one God. You have three gods. And if one God is the summation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, then that means that the summation of God the Son is also God the Father and God the Spirit, which means also that the summation of the Spirit is God the Son and God the Father. So what happens is you actually have three gods instead of, I'm sorry, nine gods instead of three. One, two, three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One, two, three, God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. And one, two, three, God the Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. So it's nine gods wrapped up in three expressions, which, you know, becomes very confusing. And it's really only a human, psych, um, humanistic ideology, theology, philosophy. So really, the Trinitarian is one God in three persons, one actual being, which lends itself to modalism. And then there's three gods in tritheism, which lends itself to partialism. You only have part of one god, part of another god, and part of another god. So that basically helps, I think, explain the two camps. But the thing with the Seventh-day Adventist Church is they're both. And what you could do is just read Doug Batchelor's recent book from maybe two or three years ago, which was like 2017, 2018. I guess that would be three or four years ago. And you can read that he covers all kinds of Trinitarianism. If you're a modalist, if you're a partialist, if you're a tritheist, if you're a believer in the one true God, claiming, if you um, are Trinitarian, all of those things mixed with even other potential options are all pulled into one book. And then as long as you believe anything like that, you can be a Seventh-day Adventist. That's basically what that book is teaching. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you actually mentioned my second question, but I want you to make more clear regarding where was the Holy Spirit during the creation, if it is not part of the creation. Okay, sure, let's look at that. Now remember, the Bible teaches in, and I'll, we'll look at it in just a second, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Okay? That is an expression of what? Now, in verse 3, you have an expression of how. So the what is in verse 2. The how is in verse 3. The Spirit of God hovered. That's the what. And then the how is God said, let there be light. So the same thing happened in the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. In verse 16, the Bible says, The Spirit of God descended, as it were, a dove and lighted upon him. That's the what. Well, the how comes in verse 17. It was when God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Spirit of God comes down, is the what. And then the how is God said. That is not difficult to find. You go to Youth's Instructor and you look up the word emblematical. And there's one paragraph in all of Youth's Instructor that will explain exactly what I just talked about, about the, the baptism and the Spirit. And what is being said is in, Gal um, let's see, Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and also Psalm 33 verses 6 and 9. We're going to see that the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, if Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 63, 
that the words that he speaks are spirit. Could it also be true that the words that the Father speaks are spirit? The answer is yes. And so here we have God speaking, and how does he speak? He speaks through his Son. I'll give you that just quick explanation. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. God has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Okay, that's how God speaks to us, is by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also God the Father made the worlds. So God spoke to us through his Son, and God created the worlds through him as well, is what this is saying. Excuse me, let me turn off my phone. And then we'll verify that that's true by going to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, where it says that God created all things by Jesus Christ. God the Father created all things by Jesus Christ. So now, going back over here to Genesis chapter 1, the word or spirit of God, according to John chapter 6, verse 63, the words of Christ are spirit, and the words of God are spirit as well. God created all things through his Son, which is the word, right? So the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay, that's true. It did happen, but what does that mean? We all know Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So the word and the breath of his mouth is referred to here as where and or rather how he created. But in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, it's the Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 9 of Psalm 33 says, He spake, that was with words, and it was done. He commanded with words, and it stood fast. So the Spirit or Word of God moving upon the face of the waters is explained further in Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. And so there's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that God created by His Spirit in His Spirit alone. Sorry, I'm trying to figure this out. And so what we have is the word of God was hovering over the waters. And it's explained how it was done in verse 3 where it says, God said, let there be light. You can't put both of those two things together. Um, I mean, I guess you could. You could have said, like Moses when he was writing Genesis, he could have said, when God spoke his spirit or words were moving over the face of the waters. And he said, let there be light. I mean, if he said it that way, we would totally understand. He didn't say it that way, but that's what is being said. If you put prophet with prophet, which is Moses and David, you combine them two and you realize, oh, it's the word of God that was being used. Now, if you know anything about audio editing, in fact, I'm going to bring it up right now just so I can show this. Um, I'm going to show this uh, um, illustration. And so on the screen, when that program comes up, I'm going to record my voice. And what's going to happen is when you're seeing my voice being recorded, every time I say something, there is going to be a wave form. It's a little uh, jump in the sound level because it's showing that there are actual waves of noise or vibration coming from my mouth, which starts in my mind, by the way. So everything comes from my mind through my mouth, and these waveforms are actually hovering. They're traveling through the room or through the field or wherever I am when I'm speaking my words, and you'll be able to see that the same thing happens with me as what happened with God, because God created us in his image. So when he spoke, his words or spirit were hovering over the face of the waters. Let me share with you this um, idea real quick. I'll make this full size. So can you see this now? I'm sharing with you the screen and every time I speak, there is a waveform. If I am silent, there is nothing there like this. Actually, there is something there because I have a fan on in the background and you can see that the fan is being picked up by the microphone. So just like this, where these words are hovering, you can see they're not moving anywhere. They're just static. But 
the reason why they are being pictured like this is similar to uh, seismograph, I think they're called, when you are um, looking at an earthquake. It's a static that shows you how much movement was going on during that time. Similar thought here. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to just erase it because I don't need it. I'm going to hit no. I don't want to record it. But the point is that God was creating all things by his son with the words, as you can see in Psalm 33 and 6, that's what happened in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Is that helpful? Yes. Does it bring up more questions, or is that something that helps answer those questions? It's it helping me just to study more. Okay. And uh, it means that I, I can uh, I can't take just only what is written in the Bible and then in the Spirit of Prophecy. So this, this is helpful. So let me just uh, add to one thing. You had asked where was the Spirit during that time. The Spirit was in all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily and in all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. We looked at that yesterday from Bible Training School when you brought it up from 1906. That two, those two paragraphs makes it very clear. God is all the fullness. The Son is all the fullness. The Spirit is in all the fullness. And so where was the Spirit? It was in the Father. It was in the Son. It's not a different, separate, floating thing that has decisions and fills, um, you know, all space. That is spiritualism. And so that's, you had asked that question, I forgot to clarify. So please go ahead. Only the Father and the Son was a participant creation. Right. Okay. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, it says that in the beginning was the word, and that the word was with God, and the word was God, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So, uh, there are some perspective view on this scripture that this, uh, the word himself was the Father, and uh, there are some views also says that. Uh, this scripture is talking only about uh, one personality, which is the Father. How, uh, what is your uh, view on this one, man? That should be very simple to answer because what you have is in John chapter 1, verse 1, and also, um, let's see, verse 1 and 14. You have the Bible describing who the Word is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. Now, if somebody could show that God the Father was made flesh, it would prove that they are actually a Trinitarian. They believe in one God that is really three people in one body, and he was God, and later as a modalist, he became the Word and took on flesh. And then now, he is a spirit. That's what a Trinitarian would have to believe, as God would later become flesh and then later become spirit. I reject that because Jesus was not praying to himself as though he was in heaven. He was actually praying to his Father, which was in heaven. And the Spirit had not been yet given while Christ was on the earth because he had not yet been glorified. You can see that in John chapter 7, verse 39. So when you're reading here in the Bible, in the beginning was the Word, that Word first was with God. It was not somewhere else. It was first with God. That's what it says. The Word was with God. And so in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. If the, if the verse stopped right there, then you would have to conclude that the Word was with God, not somewhere else. The Word was with God. And then later, the Word was God. Oh, okay. So now, first, the Word, which comes from your mind, the Word was with God and then was God. So now you have this one that we talked about yesterday, who actually became our God, the one that created all things because his Father enabled him to do so. It was actually that God created all things through him. <clears throat> then you have that Word, which is the Son of Man, becoming flesh. Now, this is not just God the Father becoming flesh. This is the one that dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. It wasn't the glory of God. It was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. 
And the Father is God. Why, why do I say that? Well, because notice what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter, whoops, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, where it says, now this is the Apostle Paul speaking, to us, to the believers, to the apostles, to the Father, the Son, and the angels, to us, there is but one God, one of them. Now, one God in three persons? Nope, that's not what he says. There is one God. Who is it? It is the Father. Okay. So now over here in John 1 verse 14, when it says, We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That one Father is that one God, according to Paul. One God, one the Father, of whom are all things, and we are in him. Now, there's one Lord. Who's that? The Word, Jesus Christ. By whom are all things. So God the Father is the one of whom, of whom are all things. Everything comes from him. Now the Son of God, Jesus Christ, everything is by him. So all things are of the Father, everything is by the Son. So you have the one God who has an only begotten Son, okay? And that one God is the one that first had that word. The Word was first with God, and then the Son was begotten, and the Word was God. And then it says all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, what do you think about that? That is clear. Okay. Praise God. Uh, the first thing is, yesterday we read from the, the book of the Science of the Times, I mean, uh, from the sense of the text, Mark 8, 19, 10, uh, we said the Holy Spirit is free in the free, working, and independent agency. Uh, can you give me the details about what it means that independent agency? I will try, but I will say this for sure. It will be far better. Let me... Uh, in this real quick. It will be far better for you to understand what the Bible teaches on what a spirit is before trying to understand what the agency of the spirit is. Now, I did give a reference to a study yesterday, which was the mind and the spirit in the Bible. If you understand that the mind is equal to the spirit and the spirit is equal to the mind, not every time the word spirit is used does it mean the mind. For example, Job chapter 27, verse 3. I'll just read it to you. It says, Job 27, verse 3, it's, um, All the while my breath is in me, and the, here it is, Ruach. The Ruach of God is in my nostrils. So, the Ruach, which we know is the word spirit, it says that spirit is in my nostrils. Now, does that mean the mind of God is in my nose? Of, of course not. What it means is the breath of God, the fact that he has given me life, is the one that gave me the ability to breathe, it's in my nostrils. So this word does not necessarily mean the mind, okay? But you can go and find that um, Daniel chapter 2, verse 2, I believe it is. Um, no, verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled. Now his, what is that word? Ruach, the same exact one. But what it means is, his mind was troubled, and his sleep broke from him. That's why he couldn't sleep, is because his mind was going. And you can read later in Daniel chapter 7, I think it's verse 15, where it says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit. Okay, how, how are you grieved in your spirit? Well, you're grieved in your mind in the very core of my being, okay, the midst of my body, the visions of my head, which is where my mind is, they troubled me. So Daniel was grieved, Jesus was grieved, Paul was grieved, you know, like people in Genesis were grieved in their spirit, in their mind. So when you understand the idea that the uh, spirit is the mind, then you can know that God's mind is used in people like you, in people like me, and here's the thing. God's Spirit is in my mind, 
But if I find a certain situation, let's call it situation A. If I find myself in situation A, because of my background, because of my ability to fight rather than flight, because of my previous aggressions, because of my knowledge of like how to swing my fists or whatever, whatever it is, I might face that situation like this ready to like actually attack whatever it is, situation A. But somebody else who perhaps has been beaten their whole life and they're afraid of different things, they have anxiety, they're going to meet the same situation A and they're going to turn around and run. Now, which one had God's Holy Spirit? Well, they both might. I might just be ready to protect myself, whereas that person's ready to run. But that Spirit of God is in me as an agent with its own personality because it's mingled with me. And say this other person that runs, that Spirit of God has its own personality as well because it's mingled with that person. And this is the independent agency that is like making up this agency of the Holy Spirit. So it's not that God's mind makes you do exactly what he wants you to do. No, you have a decision whether you follow that right now or you follow it now or you don't follow it at all. Maybe you follow it later. Or you might have to like do your nails first, or you might have to brush your teeth. You might have to put on a blue shirt with a, with a blue tie. You might have to comb your hair or whatever you're going to do first before you do what God's mind is telling you to do. This is the independent agency that's being referred to. As far as I can tell, God is using the angels. And I'll tell you, if you read Story, to, Sto, Story of Redemption, page, I believe it's 41 or 42 and onward. Jesus explains to the group of angels that were there in heaven before the fall that he is going to have to create man. And then he's going to make himself a little lower than the angels. And the angels are just blown away. What? Are you serious? Why are you going to do that? You're going to make yourself a human? Jesus says, yes, and you're going to have a special part. You're going to have to help me in this walk against the evil one, which of course was Lucifer. He had fallen and all those things were going on. And so this is, the angels are amazed at what's happening. And he says, I am going to give my life. And Ellen White says, some of the angels, not all of them, some of the angels yielded their lives as an alternative. They said, well, why don't you take me and offer me instead of yourself? And Jesus was very thankful for the offer, but he said, you're not worth enough. You are a created being. I am a divine being. I have been brought forth from my father. I will take on flesh made lower than the angels for the suffering of death, so that I can die a righteous life and I can be resurrected. God the Father's not going to do that. He couldn't do that. That would be impossible, right? God cannot die. The Bible says he's the only one with immortality. So what you have is some of these angels have different minds. They don't all unanimously say, I'll do it. No, some of them said, well, take me instead of yourself. While others were saying, Oh, that's a good idea, but I, I, I'm not really interested in doing that. I just want to see what's happening. And so the Spirit of God, the mind of God, is working as an independent agent within each one of you, within me, within the angels, which in, within anybody who's willing to listen to God's voice, because he doesn't control us. We have to co-work together. And if we co-work together, then Psalm, uh, sorry, Philippians chapter 2 can come to pass. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, how? Because it is God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And some of us follow his pleasure a little better than others. Some of us struggle. We sin, we confess. We sin, we confess. We sin, we confess. Some of us are willing and able to just to say, you know what? I confess. I'm done with that. Let's move forward. And so really, every single one of us are an example of God's independent agents. And we all make up this agency of the Holy Spirit. God uses people like you. He uses people like me. And you cannot find something that is a spirit divested of some being or a body which can think and act and make decisions, etc. So if we divorce ourselves from the idea that there is some kind of spirit being that doesn't have a body and doesn't have a throne, doesn't have a crown, doesn't have a place up there in heaven when, God, when Ellen White says all of heaven and then mentions God the Father, the Son of God, and the angels, 
You have to think of the Spirit as something other than that. And the biblical alternative is that it is God's mind, it's God's mind in you, it's God's mind in me, and the angels, if we're willing to have God lead us. But again, each of us have our own decisions on when, where, and how that is all done by God. I hope that's helpful. Uh, yes, it is. Tibeso, let me let me ask you, did what I say make sense to you? Exactly. Under present, just as a, a very interesting and a new explanation for me too. Maybe I can't I have explained it to others. So that's why my brother Daniel inboxing me. Keep silent, not speak more. <laughs> that's why I just started. I wanted to ask to make sure I'm I wasn't. I'm learning it. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I wanted to ask you, Tibeso, because I know you're a student, and I wanted to make sure that what I was saying was not contrary to what you have concluded. And so, uh, thank you. Okay, Brother Daniel, please. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, let's continue with uh, what is written in the book of Desire of which Actually, we, we have seen this one also yesterday, but. Uh, can you explain more or give me another references from this paper prophecy which we which shows that the Holy Spirit is not part of the heavenly hero? Second to that, the third person of Godhead who had come with the no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. This is also what is written in the book of Testimony to Ministers and the Gospel Workers, page 392, paragraph 2. Now, the third person of God who would come with no modified energy. If the Holy Spirit is not the third person of God, it could have been said that it's just only, uh, it could have been only mentioned maybe the Father and the Son. What is the importance of mentioning here about the three living persons or the heavenly hero if if it is not if the holy spirit is not really part of the god I, I really want to understand and i want you to emphasize on that as well okay my last point is do you mind if i could be resisted and overcome but mm -hmm. I was going to say, do you mind if I answer that? But I can see you're, you're actually reading the same paragraph that you just talked about in Testimonies to Ministers. It's the same thing. Go ahead. Desire of Ages, page 532, yeah. right? Yes, it is the same thing. Okay. And also, sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agents of the third person of the, the Godhead. My question here is, the sin could be resisted by the third person of God here. If this is not the Holy Spirit, the sin will be resisted by whom? By Jesus or by the Father? Okay. Good question. Now, you have asked several questions, and so I'm going to try to remember what it is that you've said, but I, I want to make sure that we understand the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. I believe that. It's the third power of the Godhead. But how is, I think, what we're talking about that where we differ? So, um, and I think we might understand differently who as well. Okay. But you, it sounds to me like you're expecting the third person to be not person one, not person two, but person three. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I heard you say yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, so I want you to do your homework to find the first person of the Godhead. Find that phrase in the Bible or in the writings of Ellen White. And then look for the phrase second person of the Godhead in the Bible or in the writings of Ellen White. You won't find either of them. There is no such thing as the first person of the Godhead or the second person of the Godhead. There's no such thing. Those don't exist. 
They're ideas that you need to move from your head because they're there because you are a tritheist, not because you believe what the Bible teaches, okay? And I'm not being rude, I'm not being mean, I'm just trying to be honest that that is where those thoughts come from. And so when you take away those ideas from your mind, now you don't have the first person or the second person of the Godhead because they don't exist. The only thing you have is the third person of the Godhead. And you're like, wait a minute, that phrase doesn't exist in the Bible. But what does exist in the Bible is the grammatical third person. When you look at that, all of a sudden it opens up. You're like, wow, it's all over the place. God speaks of himself as he and him, Jesus, when he was referring to the good shepherd, he was talking about the good shepherd is the one that leads. He is the one that they follow. Um, they call unto him, etc. I don't remember all the phrases, but he is the good vine. He refers to himself in the grammatical third person. When you look up the phrase in the New Testament, son of man. In fact, I'm going to do that real quick with you. I'm going to go and look up son of man. Whoops. And I'm going to quote it. And then I'm going to bring it to the New Testament, which is right there. I'm going to hit enter. Okay. So 88 different times, I'm going to zoom that real quick, 88 different times, which is the total number of hits, is how many times this phrase, Son of Man, shows up in the New Testament. Now, let's see what happens. This is Jesus speaking. You can see it in red letters. The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Wait a minute. Jesus is speaking of himself. Why does he speak of himself in the third person? Well, because that is the third person. It's Jesus speaking of himself. That's what I was saying yesterday. Now, let's look at this next one. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sixth of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go into your house. This is Jesus speaking, and Jesus referred to himself in the grammatical third person. So this is the third person. You don't find first person or second person, but you do find the grammatical third person in the Bible. So now, when you have seen that, and you understand that Ellen White did never mean, never, never a single time did she mean, that third person should mean the third being. There's being one, being two, being three. She never meant that. She meant that the Father and the Son are the two only that have divinity. There's no such thing as in the Godhead. You won't find that phrase, in the Godhead. There, it's not a place. It's uh, an attribute. So it is of the Godhead. That's the phrase you'll find. You'll, you'll see that the Father is all the fullness of the Godhead. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead. The Spirit is in all the fullness of the Godhead. You won't find in the Godhead. So it's, like, it's not like God the Father is in the Godhead. The Son is in the Godhead and the Spirit is in the Godhead. It, that doesn't exist. It's a phrase that needs to be wiped out of your mind because it's tritheistic. It's not biblical. It's not even what Ellen White meant. So you have... The Father who is of the Godhead. You have the Son who is of the Godhead. And the Spirit is in the fullness of the Godhead. Now, remember yesterday we were talking about this idea where it says in the Bible in, Gen in Ephesians chapter 3 that we can have all the fullness of the Godhead within us. Right? Now, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, what it means is that we can be a partaker of the divine nature, just like Christ was a partaker of the divine nature. It pleased the Father that in his Son dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead. That's Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, and that's also chapter 2, verse 9. And then what you have is, in Ephesians chapter 3, I think it's like verse 20, you have us as being partakers of all the fullness of the Godhead. Now, what that teaches us is, that the Spirit can be in us. Well, what is that Spirit? The Spirit is in all the fullness of the Godhead. And so the angels are actually what make up the third person of the Godhead in a practical sense. 
Not that it is the Spirit, but they are the ones that minister the Spirit. Humans, in the same way, are the ones that make up the third person of the Godhead because those, obviously, that are willing to surrender ourselves to God because that's how God works. In fact, Ellen White says, and I'll, I'll try to show it to you here, it says, um, I'm going to share my screen as I try to search this because I want you to see what I'm doing. Um, let's see, spirit is enabled and... Um, yeah, I'll find that's here it is youth's instructor. I, I don't want to go to the compilations, which is this one and this one, but I want to go. You could go to the actual letter or the one that was published. This published one, youth's instructor right here. It says a measure of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. But then it says through the ministration or ministry of the angels. So it's through the ministry. The, the actual working together with God, through the working together with God of the angels, the Holy Spirit is, what's the next word? Enabled. To work upon the mind and heart of the human agent and draw him to Christ. Okay? When you understand the idea that the ministering angels are actually enabling the Holy Spirit, as it says right here, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the minds. When you understand that, you see it come out from everywhere. All of a sudden you realize the angels are involved extraordinarily. And so this idea of the angels enabling the Holy Spirit to work upon the mind and heart of the human agent, you realize, wow, the Holy Spirit isn't just floating around by itself to then work on the mind and heart of the human agent. Oh no, it is through the ministration of the angels that the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the heart and mind of the human agent. And of course, that's what draws him to Christ. And so when you try to understand this idea of a third being, that's where it becomes really confusing. You're not able to understand what's being said in the, I think, very plain English when you look at the third person idea. So get rid of the first person, get rid of the second person, they don't exist. You do have a third person of the Godhead. You do have all the fullness bodily, you have all the fullness manifested, and you have the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, but you don't have three beings in the Godhead. Does that, does that help at all? Yes, it is. Okay, so th this is a very, very different way to think compared to tritheism. And it will have to be that you truly bring yourself back to the same thoughts over and over and over. It's like what John the Baptist was teaching. He lays the axe to the root of the tree. Well, that doesn't drop the tree down. That only gives you one hit. And then you got to hit it again, and you got to hit it again, and you got to hit it again. You don't hit it all over the place. You hit it in the same spot again and again and again and again. Pretty soon, using the same ideas, the same scripture, the same spirit of prophecy quote, you're able to hit that thing and then after a while that tree comes down and you're like, oh man, now I can see past that tree. I get it. And so that, that laying the ax to the root of the tree is something that has to happen over and over again. Now, here, in this, I'm going to read the entire paragraph. It's a little longer, so bear with me. In describing to his disciples the office work that right there is the agency, okay? The office work is the agency. And you don't have one person working in the office here. You have lots of office workers. You have angels, you have humans, you have evangelists, you have teachers, you have pastors, you have Sabbath school teachers, you have people that publish, you have the, you know, whatever. You have all of those people working in the office of the Holy Spirit. Jesus sought to inspire them with joy and hope that inspired his own heart. Well, why is that true? Why is it true that in describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was trying to inspire with joy and hope the disciples as he was inspired? I mean, if, if the Holy Spirit worked independently of himself without anybody else, wouldn't Jesus just say that without inspiring them with joy and hope? 
Well, I mean, come on, guys. You don't have to do anything. It's the Holy Spirit doing it all. No, that's not what he was saying at all. He was talking about the office work, which included his disciples. And that is what inspired them with joy and hope. Okay, He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided. Who had provided? He had provided. What, what help was that? It was the office work of the Holy Spirit. That abundant help he had provided, it was for his church. The Holy Spirit, which is the mind of God through fallen humanity in the life of Jesus Christ that had never sinned, the Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from the Father for the exaltation of his people. Wait, the, the Holy Spirit's going to exalt his people? Yes. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. So the Spirit is an agent. The Spirit is a regenerating agent. Do you know what else what you know what else regenerates? The Word of God regenerates your mind, right? Without this, the sacrifice of Christ would be of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries. The power of evil. Whose power is that? That Satan's power had been strengthening for centuries. And the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. So here it is. Sin, which is going contrary to God's law, sin could be resisted and overcome. So two things, resisted and overcome. Only, that gives you one option, only through the mighty agency, which is the office work, uh, let's see, which is described up here, the office work, okay. It says the Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Now, I want to show you something. I actually own, in my own library, the one of the original 1898 versions of the, the book, The Desire of Ages. And I'm going to see if I can just bring it up this way real quick. I'm going to show you an image now of my actual book. This is page 671. You can see it right there. Anyways, here's the 671 page. You can see it right there. This is the Desire of Ages. It's in a chapter called Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. And you're going to see right toward... There it is. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. Now wait a minute. Third person. That looks a little different here then it looks in the published works right here. Okay, minus, minus the underline, okay? This right here is actually capitalized. Capital T, capital P. Ellen White never intended for that to be capitalized. So the mighty agency of the third person grammatically of the Godhead is what she meant. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church has just you know, very minor, minimally changed the publications of Ellen White to make it look like Ellen White meant a title, third person of the Godhead. So wait a minute, what's going on? Well, it's actually their intent to help people like you and me believe that there is such thing as a being called the third person of the Godhead or the Holy Spirit. So now, Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, just as much strength as it was originally here. But remember, the Bible says in John chapter, whoops, John chapter 7, verse 39, that Jesus spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should, future tense, receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet... Why? Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So wait a minute. The Holy Ghost was not yet because Jesus was not yet glorified. So only when Jesus was glorified is when the Holy Ghost was? Yes, that's what the Bible teaches. You can read that in John chapter 16 when Jesus is saying it himself as well. So now, with the same energy that it had before, this third person of the Godhead would come, but it was in the fullness of divine power. That's the fullness that we can have just as much as the fullness that Jesus had. 
It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. Okay, so the world's redeemer is Jesus. He was able to redeem the world by his life and death. And it is the mind or spirit that effectually works out what Jesus had done. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Remember, the angels are the ones that enable the Spirit to work upon the heart and mind of man to bring them to Christ. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. That word Spirit, if you understand it as the mind, as I do, then you understand that it says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So that, of course, you could be a partaker of the divine nature. Christ, who? Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Christ is the one that has given his spirit. Wait, I thought it was like some other being. No, it's Christ who has given his spirit as a divine power. And that, empower, that power is going to impress his character upon his church. That's the divine nature. Now, I want to go real quick to, I believe I remember what it is, 324.2. And this section of the Great Controversy is really important because 324, I think that's what it is. Might be here. Yes, this is it. Now, I'm just going to read this one paragraph. You can read it for yourself if you'd like later. But the only, remember that word only? The third person of the Godhead is the one, the only way that we can overcome sin in the previous 671. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart, which is mind. That word heart means mind. So it is the indwelling of not God the Spirit. No, it's the indwelling of Christ in the heart, which is in the mind. So if Christ is in your mind through faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then we have his righteousness. So the only. Now this is 300 pages before she had said something about the third person. She had already clarified that the only defense against evil is Christ, not somebody else with a capital T and capital P third person. And so when you're looking at this idea that, um, what did I do here? Oh, oh, there it is. This, through the spirit, through the ministry of angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled. That's the one I would refer to before. But so that's the uh, point that I wanted to bring up in regard to 671 of the Desire of Ages is, when you read that section, after you've studied the ideas of angelic ministry, what a spirit is, what the office is, what an agency is in the writings of Ellen White, what the mind and the spirit connection can be, and who it was that gave his spirit, that paragraph makes perfect sense. God the Father, through his Son, war, won victory on this earth. They were, they were able to work together to where Christ was able to give his life, was resurrected by his Father, after he ascended, and was accepted. When he was glorified, then his spirit was given, which we know as Pentecost. That's in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost was the dissenting of the angels with Christ's spirit. And that's where all those hearts were won is because the angelic ministry was co-working with the Father and the Son and with Peter and all the apostles that were there. And so as a result of that co-working together, others were inspired and converted. I can show you all that from both the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. And then so what we have is that... That same ministry was given without any modified energy, and it was Christ's spirit that was given, and that was at Pentecost. Is that helpful at all, Daniel? Yes, it is. Good. Praise God. I will, uh, I will just uh, tell you, and uh, I took a note of uh, what, you, uh, what you mentioned, and uh, thank you, and uh, may God bless you. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say few words uh, from what I was reading today and uh, I will ask my last questions okay. after that. Uh, 
Miller rights or Adventist uh, Miller right or uh, the counters um, were actually focused on the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it, can we say that um, those who are not have the concept of, I mean, those who are believing the concept of the Trinity will not uh, uh, proclaim the full message of the self angel message? Yes, we can say that. Okay. I do have a lot of reasons why, but you asked a very, you know, pointed question, so I gave you a can, short answer. Can, can, you give, can you give me uh, one or two reasons? Sure, I, I'll do that. Um, let me see if I can replace this pin. I'm not going to replace by your uh, answer. I didn't expect that. No, it's it's clear in the Bible. You, yeah, I can give you this answer, and it's very short. You see, in the third angel's message. You have those that worship the Father, which by keeping his commandments, and it's through the faith of his Son. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 says very clearly that the Son of God is the image, the express image of the Father. So you have a Father and his image. Okay. Now in Revelation 13, you have a beast and his image. You will either worship the Father and his image and keep their day of loyalty or you will worship the beast and his image and keep their day of loyalty that's the that's the seal of god in the mark of the beast scenario the father and his image the beast and his image they both have a sign of loyalty it's saturday or sunday and if you worship the beast but you try to keep the seventh day sabbath then you're doing exactly the same thing as the jews two thousand years ago they had the right day, but the wrong God. And as a result of keeping the right day and having the wrong God, they crucified the son of the one God that they claimed to worship. So really, it's very simple. You will not be able to proclaim the correct three angels' messages as a Trinitarian. Because the God that you're calling people to fear, fear God and give glory to him, that God doesn't exist in the Bible. So what you're doing is you're calling people to worship something other than what the Bible teaches. You can't do that and claim to, to proclaim the true three angels' messages. It was that simple and, and clear? Yes, uh, but I, I'm not sure if I'm not mistaken, I will go through it again. Um, like Joseph Bates, they, they, he, he actually don't believe with Trinity, right? He did not. If you read about him, right? Uh, he did not. And uh, he even said that uh, Jesus Christ is not the Almighty God. Right. So, but he was one of the pounder. Does it mean that he is not also? Uh, he will not be saved. Well, Jesus is not the Almighty God. Jesus is the Mighty God, according to Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. The only Almighty God there is in the Bible is God the Father. Can you come back again, please? Yes. Jesus is not the Almighty God. No, Jesus is not the Almighty God. When you read, I, I, I have done this study where every single time the Bible uses the phrase Almighty God, every single time it refers to God the Father. There is one time where it seems like it refers to the Son of God, which is in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. But it does not refer to the Son of God there. Let's see, let me, let me read it for you real quick. It is um, in this section here, and it's Revelation 1, verse 8. Jesus is speaking, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay? Now, remember, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, Jesus has been given a name above every name, right? 
So yeah, yeah, you can read that, and everybody will bow to Jesus. And what some people don't include is what's actually said later. I'm going to read it just to make sure we all are on the same page. Philippians 2, 9. God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. I've had a lot of people stop right there, but that's not where it stops. It is all for the purpose of to the glory of God the Father. Okay, That clarification right there is exactly what the Bible teaches. Everything is for Christ, for or through Christ, for us, to the glory of the Father. That is, I mean, even Jesus said, let your uh, light so shine before men that they might see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, that's what it's about. We have taken the glory of God the Father and we have given it to his Son. That is wrong. Okay, we can glorify the Son, yes, but don't take away the Father's glory to do that. And so what we're doing is we're actually putting Christ in the place of God the Father, which is idolatry. Nobody can be in the place of God the Father. He is the only true God. And so here, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, he has been given a name. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Who gave him that name? It was God the Father. That's why it says, saith the Lord. The Lord which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So God the Father is the one that said all these things, that Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending. So now, Jesus is saying this. Imagine, Jesus is saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. And so Jesus isn't claiming himself to be the Almighty. Jesus is saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega because the Almighty has made me so. And so that's the only questionable verse. Every other verse in the Bible where it uses the phrase Almighty, as far as I can tell, is clearly referring to God the Father. There is no time where it refers to that, that phrase as Jesus Christ. So do your homework on that one. I mean, this is, this is uh, the questions you've asked are very, very critical and very, very big. So you are obviously a, an intelligent person. You have done your homework. You've asked these questions. Now it is on you to study like you've never studied before because th these are huge thoughts. Yeah, wow. I've tried this is a very new lesson for me. But... I, I would love to ask you, Pastor, can you please give me another term for the word Almighty from Greek or uh, Hebrew? Oh, sure. Or so, even English, word, another term, the word Almighty. Uh, in the Greek, the word Almighty is omnipotent. It's only used one time, translated omnipotent. And it is in Revelation chapter 19. I'll actually show you that verse. It is uh, Revelation 19, I think it's like verse 6 or so. And um, yeah, here it is. That's it. That's the word omnipotent. If I, tra I triple click it, it's translated almighty and omnipotent. You can see it after that little uh, colon and M dash. And so I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as of the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Okay, now you have to ask the question, where does this come from? And um, where is it? Let me see. Okay, here it is. A voice came out of the throne. Okay, this is from the very throne of God. This voice came from the throne. And that voice said, Praise our God. Wait, our God? Who's the only one on a throne in heaven that has, or on the throne, not a throne, because the 24 elders have thrones. Who is the only one out of the throne that could say praise our God? Is it God the Father or the Son of God? What do you think? Son of God. Right, exactly. So this is obviously the Son of God speaking. The voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, 
and all you that fear him, which is God the Father, both small and great. And they called him Lord God Almighty, or here omnipotent. And so this our God really clarifies that one to make sure that we know that it is God the Father, not the Son of God. So, does that help? Yes. Uh, thank you. It's really very interesting. Maybe I... Hold on, please. I, I have the last question. <laughs> It's okay. Uh, um, the movement of Seventh-day Adventists started way back after the October 22 of 1844 especially uh, this message was started and uh, the general conference was established by uh, 1863 and that there were also the fundamentals of beliefs of seven the adventist and now there is still a concept of trinity uh, and also there is a presentation Uh, which you are given and actually it really helped me to study more and dive deep uh, the, uh, studying the Bible but my question is how popular is this message is going on the world now nowadays okay how popular is this? yeah good question um, I have seen the president which is President Ted Wilson. He was in, I believe, Andrews University. I don't remember exactly where he was, but he was in one of the universities. Might have been Loma Linda. He was asked that question. Uh, the anti-Trinitarian movement is what they called it, I believe. And he actually said with his own mouth and also his hands, he said, this is a worldwide problem. That He, he did that with his hands while he said worldwide. And so this is not something that is just tickled a few ears here and there. I also can give you testimony as myself, having learned from thousands of people that they have been cast out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a result of teaching this message. Now, dear brother Daniel, you are intelligent. I can hear this from your questions. I want to ask you, if I am a Seventh-day Adventist and I have been faithful to God for over 25 years now, I am a vegan vegetarian, I am faithful in my funding, I pay tithe, I am not disobedient to God's word as far as I know. I keep all commandments, including the Seventh-day Sabbath. I love the writings of Ellen White. In fact, I study them not as much as I study the Bible, but I do study them, and I study almost nothing else. I'm a Bible student and the writings of Ellen White. I have been faithful to my wife for over 21 years now. I have been a pastor, I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher, I love sharing God's word, I constantly minister to people and give out information. Would you want me to be in the Seventh-day Adventist church or would you want me to be cast out? What do you think? Of course I want to, to be in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Right. Actually that's what the Bible says and the Spirit, Ellen Joyce said, the true revival and the reformation started in the, in the inside the church, not outside the church. So, right. So let me, let, me finish, let me finish my thought real quick. I have been kicked out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have actually been taken off the books by the conference in Central California. The reason why is because I teach differently about what they call a mystery. So you can't, you can't understand the mystery is what they say. It's, it's something beyond our thoughts. But if you teach it the way Daniel does, he's out. I've never been unfaithful to God in, in regard to, I, I, I can't say that, but let me say it this way. I have not been unfaithful to, to God in a way that would cause me to be cast out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I have taught the truth about God differently than how they believe it, and as a result, they have kicked me out. Does that sound a little strange to you? Yes, this is very strange to me. Yeah. That's what's happening to a lot of people in the world, thousands of them. You go to the Philippines, Australia, you go to South America, you all over Canada, in America, you've got just scattered all over the place. This is happening. So I know that personally just as well as Ted Wilson, but you can talk to Doug Batchelor. He wrote a book about it. You can talk to uh, Walter Feit. He's the one that was having a question and answer scenario. And he said, oh no, these people are way up the wrong you know, stream or whatever. And then you can talk to 3ABN about it, where, uh, I can't remember his name, he's a uh, Kiwi from New Zealand, 
his name escapes me right now, but he was speaking with several people in a group and um, John, I don't remember his name either. He's like from South America, tall guy, thin, but he and the Kiwi were together and they were talking and they were talking about how you need to get out if you're if you don't accept the Trinity. We've done this. We've studied it. We've gone over it. We've you know go uh, find somebody else to you know be unhappy with or something. He was quite rude when he was saying those things. But um, yeah, so it's been on three ABN. It's all over the place. This is something that once you study it, you realize wow, it's it's everywhere. So does that help? Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for asking these questions and taking the time and inviting me to be with you.